Hey, Hi. Chris. We're over on butter. If, if on butter. <laughs> uh, do you know the Mattermost or? Here's the um, link if you want to pass in the link. I'm going to grab it out of uh, Mattermost, actually. OK, cool. Thanks. That's funny. I think that Butter took a while to spin up the recording. It, it only started recording when you said that last thing here. Ah, so this is the Fellowship of the Link call for Wednesday, July 3rd, 2024. Uh, OK, Chris will be here in a minute. OK, good. Thanks. It's funny, Chris is over there. So I was like, I can yeah. talk to Chris. I can talk to Jerry. And then it's like, <laughs> doesn't work that much. <clears throat> uh, now I can work on changing my background. <clears throat> Are those asteroids in the air? Good question. They look like contrails more to me, mm -hmm. which means it's probably AI that somebody didn't quite clean up quite enough. <clears throat> Dude, I've got uh, I, I got this great by, by accident. I, I prompted prompt mid journey for random stuff. I got this great image of a woman standing against newspaper wings kind of and she's doing an angel pose and it's, it's gorgeous mm -hmm. like and i keep redoing it to to get it to fix things 80 percent of the time her feet are on the wrong legs <laughs> mid journey really does not know the difference between left foot and right foot on mid journey that's interesting because i think her mid journey is much better than dolly i the the problem is her legs are like she's jumping leaping with her legs open so mm -hmm. the the, I think if they're close together, it gets it right. If they're far apart, it's like, yeah, there's a leg. It's a, it's a foot. And I'll get a foot on it. <laughs> so it's not even two left feet. It's like, you know, she's got a right foot and a left foot. Yeah. Sorry, Chris. No, that's OK. I'm here. Hey, Chris, we hear you fine. We don't I'm, see you yet. I My video, it's still stuck, I think, on the other program. It'll switch over in a second. Oh, but OK. Pete, you look just like you always do in my dreams. Oh, like that's the, so interesting. The internet god from on high who you know, oh. <laughs> shines down. That's very uh, funny. I love the uh, participation percentages uh, on each person. Yeah, it's interesting. By, by which I mean I don't actually love it. I think it's kind of creepy. It, it's actually very interesting, but it's kind of creepy, too. The, the 70s uh, hold music was really awesome, though. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Which I had I not set up. It's just sort of there. Yeah. It's definitely awesome. I, I don't know which exact meaning of awesome I would uh, uh, assign to it, but it's awesome. It's just there's a sense of whimsy here. Yeah, yeah. I, I, that's true. Um, I've had a couple conversations recently that hover around like the Neo books topic and a bunch of other things that are exciting. And I, I don't know where this thing is heading, but um, I'm, I'm sort of more excited about Neo books than I've been in a while. Here comes Aram. Excellent. Uh, I've been thinking that, and maybe it's not a fellowship, the link conversation, but you should, you and Chris should talk about publishing and publishing where. Oh, the posse thing. Yeah. Posse yeah. and unrelated. Yeah, um, that's a good idea. Thanks. Uh, so, hey, Aram, we're just sort of just uh, getting rolling here. Uh, thanks for going along with the, the thing and tying up butter here. Um, although I don't know what just fell over somewhere, but. No, oh, that was me. Oh, OK. In fact, it was actual butter falling off my plate with a fork. So, you know. It's... Thank God. I, I was hoping it wasn't the typewriter. I, yeah. Yeah. Could hurt somebody. Oh, no, you would hear that. <laughs> it hurts the typewriter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who cares about people? Uh, it's all I, about the old tech. I, I live in Southern California, so I always um, I always lock my carriages when I, you know, walk away from the walk <laughs> away from the keyboard. So I, I close our cupboard doors in the kitchen. Yeah, 
because people say that you know it's less likely for the things to shake out of them and, and crash. It's funny. I close the cupboard doors in the kitchen because April hits her head on them regularly. <laughs> um, so I was I was sort of uh, on the neo books topic just just in general about uh, linky a lot linky live knowledge and how it works. I think is a is an interesting topic these days. Um, sadly, in the long run, it might be a piece of the remedy for what ails the world right now. Uh, but uh, not in the next four months, I don't think. Um, and then, uh, Chris, I, I brought up the question, I think, in Free Jerry's brain about posse pose. Like, where do you where do you post first? And I've, I've got two, maybe three or four places where I'd like things to be posted. The principal two being Massive Wiki and LinkedIn, but also possibly a Substack um, and uh, maybe other sorts of things. But like how to, how to keep it all in track because I also want to register each of these nodes in my brain so I can weave them together there. Um, I don't know if you have any more recent insights on that or I've forgotten, I've forgotten what your policy was. The, I, for me, the, it's far easier on most platforms will let you syndicate stuff out. Even if it's just a link back to the original thing with the title, um, but you can custom code if they have APIs or other tools will let you do that. It makes it when it's easy to do and you can pick and choose. Like I wrote this thing, let's say about typewriters. I know some people on Substack aren't going to care, so I'm not going to send it there. So having little click buttons to say, send it to these places where I think the conversation makes sense is the first thing so that you're participating in places rather than just spamming them with things your sub community in that space may not care. Um, but then the, the second thing that really makes it way more valuable is when you can have responses to those pieces come back to your original so that you can manage it all in one place. Yep. And that, tremendously lowers the burden of where was I having that conversation? How do I find it? Where is it? And even better in your case, if you can write something and put it in the brain and then share it out from there and get responses back to there. Yep. And then little notifications to say, you know, RM or Pete commented on this thing then you can read it and either integrate it better into the space you want it to be or, or not, or kind of leave it go as a, you know, a phatic signal of they saw it and it exists and great. Um, but usually it's that where syndicating out becomes way more valuable is when you see the signals come back in without having to spend time in each of those communities. So for a long time, Twitter's API worked in both directions and it really was awesome. And it meant I spent almost no time in Twitter except for maybe things that I put into a feed reader that I really wanted to make sure I didn't miss. Um, but it meant I could just kind of ignore it as a thing. And the people who wanted to see those things from my website would see them and if they didn't uh, you'd move on and go from there. Um, but increasingly, a lot of the big platforms either have been making it harder. Facebook, that two-way street doesn't exist since, I don't know, 2017, 2018, I think. Um, Twitter turned theirs off. I don't, I haven't played with LinkedIn in a while, but I, the syndication out is usually pretty easy. The getting responses back, not always. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I th I think it was Aram who um, shared share openly on one of our calls. I think I don't remember, but I'm not sure exactly what it does or how it works. I think it's oh probably... yeah, it's um. So Ben Ward Mueller, <laughs> and I'm trying to think of where he's at now because he just shifted jobs again. He essentially, think, go ahead, Arl. Probably. Oh, he was just at the nineteenth. I think he might still be there, but 
Uh, no, he was at the uh, 19th and he left. I want to say he's at... Um, uh, I have him under known. Who's the other? Who's the other group that just broke? Says senior off? director of technology at ProPublica. Yeah, I was going to say is Pro, oh, ProPublica oh, oh. the place where he's at now. Huh. Um, but he's started out in technology applied to education um, and built one of the first social networks for the education space. Um, and then he launched Known, which was a a web platform that was built for indie web first um and that has kind of suffered he went to uh, medium for a while and then it's kind of bounced around and now he's got a small baby who's like maybe a year old um but real smart guy I, he kind of gets it and the things he's doing are kind of smart and with it um, I would invite him here, but I think with all the stuff he's got, the, all the balls he's juggling, it would be just one more ball yeah. for him to juggle. And I, I worry for his mental health sometimes. Um, cause you know, having a one-year-old is not an easy feat to, mm -hmm. to deal with. Um, but it's, I think he built that sometime probably in the last six months to help make it easier to share from one place or another. Um, and I, I tinkered with it, I think, when he released it, but I don't remember it offering anything above and beyond what my website already did. So I, you know, didn't have a, a use case for it. Um, but I think for, you know, the non tech, folks it helps lower the bar of how easy or hard is it to do some of that technology thank you it allows like sharing to whatever your mastodon instance is if you want to support that um because it has a nice little fill in there for that i think it's and it's also nice because <clears throat> it works well with anything with static site design stuff. But I think you're really right that this is the conversation that matters. How do you converge the conversation? Even, even if you post in lots of different places, how can they all come back to one place? And also not just for the convenience of the poster, but for the building of a community around the thought. So that the thought, the thought is happily distributed to a variety of platforms that have different audiences and different flows, but then the conversation can converge. That'd be great. Uh, and you could, I guess you could put a link um, inside at the end of a post that says, hey, to talk about this, go here. And we could just steer them back toward, uh, my audio seems, uh, I'm, re I'm hearing everybody else pretty solidly. Um, um, yeah, I'm uh, hearing everybody too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, can, I can hear everyone fine, but every time I mute or unmute my incoming audio from this, from my whole machine flickers. Is, I, do you have Bluetooth in the? No. Maybe you're causing a disturbance in the force. No, oh, maybe. No, I've noticed every, we've tried a whole bunch of this here. I didn't want the other groups I'm involved in. Try a whole bunch of these, and for whatever reason, they seem to not do a great job with, like, grabbing and releasing the various audio properties. I'll just mute from my device instead of using the mute button. So if you hit that, the, so if you hit the, stop. if you hit the M button, which is a shortcut for muting on here, does that make any difference? The M key. Uh, okay, yeah, that does make a difference for some reason. Oh, interesting. And Click weird. it on the browser. It. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It doesn't. It it causes the audio to flicker, but pressing the M key doesn't for some reason. Very strange. Um, if you click on the mic uh, microphone, a mic icon, there's uh, audio settings in there. Maybe you could fiddle a little bit. Yeah. No, it's all set how I'd expect it to be set.
Yeah, my uh, I think I have another couple of days left on the trial period for Butter. I haven't signed up for it, um, so it's still in eval for me. I, I like it. It's just that it's another expense, and I I don't know when I'm going to get around to using the actual features that it's really good for. I think it would be excellent if I were doing um, webinars or kind of private courses that needed uh, an agenda and structure or or workshoppy stuff. If I was going to do a workshop around design from trust. I'd probably really like and really use uh, the tools that are here. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it's, you know, putting aside the random yeah, problem really. that I'm having. I think it's fine. I, I feel like <clears throat> with like modern modern browser technology, building like successful video conferencing software is like an extremely low bar so it really is what features do you want to have with it right and do and does it do it well they're just like anyone can at this point anyone can theoretically build like a web rtc conference room right right <laughs> yeah. so yeah yeah it's all about the features are they the ones you want will you use them and the usability right yeah and the uh, elevator music um <laughs> and, and thinking through applications i think butter is designed for facilitators uh who want those kinds of tools and they've done a nice job of it there's workflow stuff you can do uh, there's a bunch of automations etc and there's like a tools a tools ecosystem that seems to be pretty interesting uh to to observe a marketing challenge they have uh, all of those features aren't apparent to me and so the virality is uh, much less than it ought to be um, in fact those features are kind of hidden from everybody until a facilitator puts them to work yeah. so you would only you would only probably <laughs> encounter them if they did some marketing which i haven't seen any of so mm. um, yeah oh i see what's happening here it's releasing the microphone permission when you mute, uh, and that's what's causing the problem. Normally, when you mute in video conferencing software, it doesn't release the microphone; it just <laughs> stops the sound from coming. Wait, it's actually uh, letting. It's actually, it's actually re reconnecting to the microphone every time you mute. That sounds weird. Every time you unmute. No, but yeah. the, the mute unmute cycle, like like that, involves yeah. a, break, a break and a reacquisition of the mic. That's very yep. weird. Yeah, it that is very makes weird. a literal sense, right? Really? It's like, oh, we don't, we're not using this resource. So I just and, hit uh, mute and unmute, and it was instantaneous, right? Unless my voice broke. No. Uh, yeah, it was instantaneous, but like, Aaron, and you your, already gave permission, right? I'm I'm using Firefox and OS X, but you can see in Firefox, right? Normally, like, if I'm using Google Meet, right, and I mute myself. The little microphone icon at the in the URL bar stays in place because it's still accessing my system's microphone even if I'm muted, right? But when I mute, <laughs> you just uh, made it uh, yeah, it it removes that access, like it, it releases the access to the microphone, which yeah, I mean it makes literal sense. Um, it's They're just very strange. Here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's probably like quite inefficient, um, technically speaking. And I'm using the Butter app on Mac OS, um, not Butter in the browser. Yeah. Just like I use the Zoom app, right? Same sort of thing. And their app is pretty nice. Uh, but I'm wondering whether the architecture of the mute feature is the same in the app as opposed to the browser. And I'm wondering whether different browsers have different skill levels at doing what you just said on. Yeah, probably the, the app, app is, is a, yeah, Electron. Different. Yeah. So Chromium. Oh, yeah. okay. So it's still the same set of engines, kind of? Uh, it's, but, well, different than Firefox. Yeah, but, it's yeah. different than Firefox. Yeah. And it could be yeah. doing some other different things in there, too, because Chromium's a little closer to the metal. I found that that solved the audio problem with Around when we were trying Around, um, which is I had to download the app for it. Otherwise, I experienced a very similar problem. Admittedly, I may be like an abnormal actor in this regard. Not just am I using Firefox, but like the audio setup for my computer is very strange. Um, 
compared to normal. There are no comments coming from the peanut gallery about whether or not we think of you as a normal person somewhere on the normal part of the normal curve. Yeah. Because <laughs> we're all the same abnormal that Aram is, and we're not commenting on <laughs> ourselves. Exactly. This is, this is as much a comment about the peanut gallery as about you. <laughs> um, so what other things are on people's heads uh, other than butter and um, posse and pose and whatever? What other fellowshipy kind of things? Um, I have been experimenting with Obsidian's site tool for a project that I'm working on with some other folks. Um, it's been interesting. It's very easy. I was surprised by, like, it's very easy to set the site up. I was surprised by how easy it was to set the site up. But of course, the trade-off is you don't have a lot of options. Um, right, the, the site is what it is. I guess I can download like Obsidian plugins and stuff that modify it. Is this Obsidian it's Publish not... or what is the tool that you're using? Yeah, Obsidian Publish is the one that makes the sites. Um, it was surprisingly easy to set up with a subdomain and get it mapped and get it so other people could contribute to it and all of that stuff. Oh. But of course, like, it's very difficult to modify what the output is without downloading an Obsidian plugin or doing something else, I guess. I haven't tried it with other allowing other people to use it. Is that done through the front end through the web interface, or is that solely you have to have access to the vault and then they have access to it? They have to have access to the vault, and then okay. they have to have access... Then you have to like add them as being able to publish in the Obsidian Publish plugin. Uh, and there's a but, ten dollar okay. or eight dollar per month per site fee for using it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because this is for a larger group of people, or we're just trying to get a larger group of people set up. In, I volunteered to be the one to own the site part of it. Um, Otherwise, I would not have paid more money for yet another way to put things on the web. Yeah. Um, if you ever want to talk about massive wiki builder, let me know. Yeah, I mean, I've already played around with it. I contribute. I put my uh, thing in it, right? So, yeah, yeah it's just uh, <clears throat> I, I'm. Oh, go ahead. We've got some new stuff in the pipeline, which. Some of it's kind of incremental. Some of it's, but but it's you know we're we're slowly moving. We're also looking for a new name. Uh, kind of you know, um, massive publisher would be closer to probably the right the right name, something like that. But anyway, um, you could you could subvert an awful lot of Obsidian users, particularly people of Arum's stripe, by creating a one click. Let Massive Wiki Builder do the online portion, yeah, and just host or put up, you know, give us a domain or a subdomain, and then point to the Obsidian Vault and then just go. Yeah, that's a good business right there. You know. Yeah, publish is not the smoothest like process per se. It was easy for me to get set up, but I'd imagine it'd be harder for someone less technical. Uh, well, the the, you know, the tough part really is the what flavor of wiki markdown you're using and what kind of crazy plugins is your Obsidian Vault th throwing noise on top of all of that for being able to actually, you know, almost every plugin adds its own little enhancements and trying to create a website out of those enhancements is whack-a-mole. Yeah. I imagine there's a baseline of like stuff that people really don't expect. I um, tested out. There's like a whole suite of Obsidian enhancements for using Obsidian to run a Dungeons and Dragons game. It gives you like dice rolling, and it gives you the monster manual, and it lets you set up like all sorts of like game processes in Obsidian and have records of them. 
And like stuff like that's very cool, but I'm like, that's never going to publish to a website <laughs> using Obsidian Publish or anything else, really, unless you get extremely into it, customizing whatever script is picking up your markdown. That's unexpected and cool. Yeah, it was oh. interesting to see like people really flexing Obsidian to do a lot more than I expected it could do. I almost right from the beginning, I think there was, for some reason, there were a lot of writers who were doing world building in Obsidian. And that group also has heavy overlap with the dungeon and Dungeons and Dragons space. So there were people who were building some of that stuff up for two or three years. And it's in a fascinating like subculture of Obsidian users who are doing that. And I don't know of other big applications that really cater to that as a, a thing to do on the hobby yeah, level. So. It's a whole subgenre of, of tools, um, actually. That's why like so many people hopped onto Obsidian because it was free and most of them are paid. Um, there's the novel writing tool. I cannot remember, but you all know what it is as soon as I'll say it. Scribner. I recall it. Scribner. Yeah, Scribner has like specific tools for this. There's um like is it Story Anvil? Something Anvil. Anvil of the Gods. Oops. Yeah. <laughs> World building software. There's like a whole bunch of different software. World Anvil. Campfire. Oh um, I now call it campfire writing, I guess. Um, Legend Keeper. Uh, Fantasia Archive. But mo almost all of those cost money. Um, and Obsidian has the two things that are really useful for bringing in that audience, which is one wiki links basically and to a whole subculture of people who really enjoy making videos about how they use the tool mm -hmm. <laughs> which is apparently important yeah brings it brings a lot of that crowd in hmm. um Thing I was pondering that I would love some co-thinking on. I'm going to put a brain link and then screen share it. Um, there we go. Uh, is this thought, which is um, I'm trying to think through the assumptions we have about books. So I have some unwritten laws about books which are that all the material has to be original. Uh, books don't really get updated very often. Books don't create any kind of communication channel. In fact, the assumption is that there's millions of people and you wouldn't want to talk to them all. That books, different books don't share chapters. It's related to all material has to be original. And that books over a certain length won't sell, so we don't write many of those. Um, but I'm also thinking about um, other uh, other constraints around intellectual property laws, intellectual property over protection, uh, book static nature, and all that. And these, these, this is all part of the argument about what a neo book is, um, et cetera. But any, if you have any thoughts to contribute, I would appreciate it. The one thing that strikes me there um, is the the format dictates so much, particularly by the publishing industry. So it's similar to. Um, in the 20th century with the advent of the record player and records and then other things, everybody went to a small format or shorter formats and songs almost all became on average, like three minutes long, four minutes long, right. because it fit the, the small early albums or you could put a couple on, but even once you got, you know, there are very few people writing or making music. And then the way it's distributed on radio and attention, 
you know, there were experiments in the 60s and 70s with people like, you know, Queen making, you know, rock opera type things that were bigger, coherent pieces or the Beatles, you know, doing kind of more coherent full length albums, but nothing that really took advantage of. I'm going to use all of the space that's on this album that I could publish and go from that. Um, and then from the opposite side, um, from a UI perspective, one of the things that makes things like Twitter and Mastodon so super useful and easy is you have a, a tiny box to write in. And if you overflow that, the box may, if they built some good UI, expand automatically so you can keep writing or typing. But when you're facing a blank page, you know, on the typewriter, you know there's a big blank page, so starting mentally is much harder. Mm -hmm. Now that's more and, about the writing experience than the reading experience, right? Well, and so there's, so there's some of that, but that kind of dictates the length of what's written or how it's written or where it's at. And similarly, when you're reading from a reading practice perspective, I can scroll Instagram or Twitter for hours at a time because if I don't like what I'm looking at now, the next one or the next one after that's going to give me the jolt versus uh, I probably would almost always be better served spending that hour and a half reading a book. But the hurdle of, Hey, there's this big thing in front of me. Right. And I know exactly, you know, if, you're reading Dostoevsky in physical form, you know exactly how much time is left when you're doing it. Or, you know, there are some movies when I watch them, I I'm starting to get bored and I'm thinking, okay, how much time is left in the movie so I know where it may be going or not going. And if I know what the running time is, that tells me an awful lot more about the movie and may take me out of the experience of the movie which could be similar if you're reading War and Peace on paperback format versus digital format. If you're on digital, if you're kind of in for the ride, and unless you're looking at the indicator at the bottom of the screen, you have no idea how long it may or may not be or where you're going or not going or do you care or not care. But all those little pieces add something to the grammar of the format of what you're doing but on Twitter, from a writing perspective, if you can write something short and then, hey, I want to add to that and I want to add to that, you just keep creating threads. But almost nobody goes back to a thread they started three years ago and continues it on today mm -hmm. as part of their book they're writing on Twitter, unless they're tweeting out Moby Dick, you know, 120 characters at a time. Um, but those kind of little format things heavily affect both what's written and what's read and in what formats those things exist. Um. Anyone else? Any thoughts on this? I will right, we'll stop the share. But that's, you know, a fascinating, fun little place to tinker around with. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think also being able to share like pieces of it is very difficult for books. Um, when that's like a very useful way that we deal with information now. I mean, it's in some sense too, and you may do this too, Jerry, in terms of sharing links to your brain or things you've seen before. But when I'm in a particular space and I, if it's social media, I may write a response to someone on Reddit, but I try and do it in short little nugget sized factual pieces with references for more. Mm -hmm. But I almost always save those to my own repository because invariably somebody's going to ask that same exact question again. And then I can say, oh, I've, I've written that answer already. Here it is and point to it. But then when I'm done, I can wrap all those things up if the area is big enough and either write a blog post or an article or, you know, a book. It, it really went long. 
Um, but having those like kind of slowly aggregating snowballs at the top of the hill that are, they're all slowly rolling down in various states um, of aggregation. Um, but then based on someone's context, I can point at the right size thing. Oh, you just need the, you know, forward answer. Here's that. Or you might need the forward answer, but it sounds like you might need more context. So here's the article. Mm -hmm. Or if you want to go crazy, go to this book and it'll give you that answer, but it will give you more of what you're looking for. Um, so having the context of who the person is and what they might want also will frequently kind of dictate the answer that I try to provide. Um, I did a couple of my couple recent LinkedIn posts where I found my way to a writing style I kind of really liked, which was one sentence per paragraph. Uh, and the sentences were intentionally not long and complex, but each sentence could easily be the nexus for a bunch of links and evidence and support and whatever else. Um, so I, I don't know if that's better or worse or anything, but I liked it. I, I liked the economy of it. Which I find is, for many of the reasons that Chris mentioned, very forward motion inducing. It's very easy to write on Twitter for some reason, for me at least. Well, and w once you're comfortable too with who your audience may or may not be and what you can write or not write, depending on who you are and how you identify and who may respond. Um, I mean, it's, it's terribly easier for me as a cisgender white guy to like write whatever the hell I want on the internet and not give a shit. Um, whereas for others, you know, you have to think and respond better. Yeah. Um, but usually too, I try and the friction of creating the note that's useful both for me now or in the long term for some other project also means there's a bunch of crap I just don't respond to because, you know, nine times out of 10, a person could Google the answer that they're asking. Right. And, you know, why didn't you even bother to do that as a, a bare minimum before you post it on social media? You know, which is an hashtag, interesting threshold for like internet. this course, <laughs> you know, Well, and that, you know, that's the fun of discourse, too, is if you can find the subcategory of the thing and you really don't want to delve into it or even do the search, or you might find some more interesting explanation beyond the basic. Um, but I find a lot of, um, you know, there's a, a bunch of Reddit communities where people will dip their toes in to ask one question because they know the answer is there somewhere and they feel comfortable doing that. But they could just as easily search whatever that sub is and probably find their answer, having been asked a million times before. But there's also the other issue of if someone had created a wiki on that Reddit sub that has most of those answers, does that does that deflate the value of a community that's being built there, constantly re-answering those? you know, same 10 questions. Um, so you may come to ask a question and because of your experience there, then you actively participate for a longer term versus, oh, I got the answer and then I walk away. Um, I do think it's sort of like, uh, it's a problem that different tools deal with differently, right? Like Stack Overflow has a process for like, this is the thing, right? This is the right answer for shutting down questions that are new questions to the old answer and just linking them back. 
Which is good. We want more of that kind of behavior, right? I mean, there's times when it's a premature shutting down of conversation or improvement. There's other times when it's a nice convergence of what we know and a reference back to like, a, here's a great answer for this. Like, let's just point back to that. You see it now and then on support boards for software. Yep. Or occasionally you'll get the somebody who's never been there or answered that question before will come up with a newer, better answer or more comprehensive or a, hey, but what about these other three sub cases that don't generally fit that, but also would be useful to others? Yep. But as you know, AI teaches us it's all been answered before, and if it hasn't, you just make up an answer. So, I'm intrigued by the, the AI engine that they overtrained by accident. Um, do you all remember the story? I'll, I'll find it in my brain. But that basically, there was a research group <clears throat> that trained up a, an LLM, and then accidentally, uh, a guy went away for a vacation for a month and left, left the thing running. And it came back and it was sort of smarter than you'd expect. It had somehow gotten to some level of, and, uh, I have no idea if it was going back over the same training data over and over and over. I, I don't know what it was doing. I'll, I'll find the article. Um, but that it had gotten somehow smarter to the point where it was grokking. There we go. Uh, I think this is the article. This, and there's a study. There's a study that it's pointing to, which is from here. Yeah. There. I think I bookmarked that article a couple months ago and hadn't gotten back to read it. There you go. Um, I think there's uh, this falls into the bin of unexpected silver linings of all this work, of, of stuff that might surprise us because of we don't expect it, we're thinking linearly, whatever else it might be, and all of a sudden something something interesting happens. I think it's going to be this this nature of event like that. Um, somewhat related to that, but slightly different. I've been mulling over, uh, there's a germ of a thesis that I've had for a while based on Kahneman and Tversky's work in behavioral economics and the presidential debate brought some of it forward and gave it a little spin. And I'm curious, it's, it kind of relates to our, some of the ideas we talk about in terms of sense making and building and where AI may be going. Um, but other than the identity piece in terms of how people identify in terms of who they are and their political, religious and other views, one of the big pieces that I see playing out in politics and it, it comes because broadly, I think that Donald J. Trump is a system one thinker only. He's only able to come up with a knee jerk reaction to the thing he's talking about. And he doesn't care about second, third or fourth order thoughts or consequences to his thinking other than how they affect his own ego. So he'll say a lot of stuff which generally doesn't mean anything or could be read. And if you want to believe what he's saying, you'll latch onto it because it reinforces your bias already. But usually the sentences he says, if you read them kind of written out, they make almost no sense and they aren't full sentences to begin with. Whereas on the other side, Biden is a very logical 
And in the debate, almost all of his responses were one, two, three responses. And it's obvious he's thinking about what comes next, what happens if I do this, how do we respond and where do we go and how do we build from there? Um, but to boil it down, I see the two choices presented to us are a, uh, a storytelling kind of gut reaction system one type of narrative that's happening on the Trump side versus a let's think about this logically, do the work, puzzle it out and figure out what makes most sense on the other side. And you're either in one camp or you're in the other. And there are very few people who are doing both system one and system two really well, in, at least in the political sphere. Um, so even in the places where, um, so there were two questions Trump took and they came back to him t t twice each. One on what should we do for childcare for Americans? And then almost a few minutes later, the other one was, how are we gonna respond to the um, opioid crisis? So he gets the question and he spends the entirety of the first segment responding to what Biden said about him either being a loser or being wrong. And he only responded to the ego portion of what Biden said and ignored the question entirely. He came back after his two minutes and was asked again, you totally dodged, you know, and almost specifically was said, you totally dodged the question, what's your response? And then yet again, in almost, he touched on opioid for about a second, but he gave no specific anything. But in both of those cases, he went back and addressed attacks Biden made at his ego rather than doing the response. So he totally lost the emotion piece of it to give any kind of logical response. And Biden, in, instead of doing the logical thing, should have appealed to the emotional and on his response should have said, I'm not, I'm going to give Donald J. Trump my minute or two minutes of response because twice in a row, he it totally ignored the question. He focused only on himself and ignored the American people. And I really want to hear his answer. And that would have been a great storytelling piece for him to come back with. But instead, he always went to the logical, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, and this is why. Um, so I'm, it's a weird sense-making thing, but we have these two systems that we're using. How do we use them in which case? And even, I don't know, that the other piece I think that has, plays around in my mind is the old um, Mars-Venus men and women communication. My wife will come to me with a problem and say, hey, I have this issue. And invariably, it's never... I want a solution to that problem. It's, I want you to hear me talk about and vent the problem. And so I always have to catch myself and listen first. <laughs> um, it's taken many years of marriage to figure this out, but you know, even when someone tells you that this is the case. Um, and I think, uh, who was it? Um, Charles Duhigg has a new book out called Super Communicators that I, it touches on a lot of it. If you start reading it, it's awful. I haven't read the whole thing through, but I, you know, from the first intro introduction, I get the gist of where the entirety of the book is going. And I will plod through mostly to find the psychology references to the underlying research, um, which I'm interested in, but I'm not sure past the introduction, he's going to make any groundbreaking um, revelations. But it, it's essentially, it's that, is how do we communicate? And we have on polar sides of our political spectrum, two people with dramatically different communication styles. And that is also tending to pull us apart, I think. Um, Pete beat me to the response. 
I comment <laughs> I forgot to apply. So please, I, you I first. Could, I have so much to say. Tell you were, yeah. <laughs> I have so much to say. Go ahead, Pete. Um, I just wanted to say I, I I appreciate the analysis, Chris, and and I kind of it it feels it feels very thoughtful and a little bit misaimed because uh, in my understanding of the world, uh, Mr. Trump is just a performance artist. Um, and the, the, his subgenre of performance art is, is called bullshit. Um, so people, you know, we used to think that he lies. He doesn't lie. He just says the thing that is most expedient, you know. And so the performance is, is part, uh, you know, making feel people good about themselves, making people feel good about hating the other side, making himself uh, feel good about and and enjoying the ego boost that he gets when he's helping his audience stroke his ego. Um, I, you know, the there's, you said he's a system one thinker and it's like, he's just, a, he's a vaudevillian um, and he's just floating on, on the performance and the performance is classical. Uh, Harry Harry Frankfurt bullshit. You know, it's it's just uh, it's uh, a, a thing that he says that that works. Uh, it doesn't have anything related to thinking or analysis or thought <laughs> or response or anything like that. Okay. Um, <laughs> there, there is that, and I I will totally grant you that that is also a massive piece of what's going on. Um, in fact, in September of 2016, while he was running and reading a transcript of his, one of his debate responses, I realized, and in vaudeville, it's called double talk or double speak. And you say a lot of shit, it means nothing. Or there are variations of it, politico babble and techno babble was one. One of them, you know, the the turbo encabulator is a great example on the techie <laughs> side from I think the late fifties or sixties. Um, but it's the when you see what he written out what he said, there's so many ums and ahs and pauses and whatever, like whatever he's saying that makes zero logical sense, other than short statements of the quality of build the wall which really can only mean one thing, but almost everything else he says is word salad to the point that it plays into your, you know, preconceived notions. Oh, the thing he said sounds like something I already believe so I can latch onto that. And I think that's in large part why he got any of the following that he did was in those cases, there were enough people who latched onto Statements that meant nothing, but they were like, oh, he's talking the way, like he thinks the way I think. And he yeah. totally does. May I speak before I explode? Yeah, yeah. Sure, yeah. It's... <laughs> okay, thanks. I hate I to mean, like... There are a lot of things going on, but yeah, I've yeah. been trying to distill down to the base principles a few of the, but yeah. As have I, as have many of us. And, and I have a wholly different perception of what he's saying and how he's saying it and all that. Uh, so Trump is having a side conversation with his followers. It goes roughly as roughly as, as follows. Watch, guys. I'm going to do something today that's just so shitty that the press and the left are just going to go into a complete froth. And everybody knows that when they're in a complete froth, they're completely neutralized. They're distracted. They're like, and, and I can predict this is going to happen. And next week, I'm going to be more powerful because of it. Watch. And he's been doing that to us since 2015. 2015. Do you remember when Scott Adams went off the rails with his positive analysis of Trump's communication style? Well, I saved all those posts. I will share the link here. But Scott Adams is saying Trump is a master persuader. So sometimes when he goes back and repeats himself five times saying the same stupid ass thing, it's because that is what you do when you're a master persuader. And he's actually really, I think, naturally gifted at that. I don't think he's done persuasion training or anything like that. I just think that he's good. He's gifted at that. He's a, he's a mafia don trained by Roy Cohn who knows never to leave evidence, don't leave any hard evidence, make sure people have a hard time connecting the crime back to you, but just run, ra run ragged over everything. 
Trump is also the only politician out there who understands modern power. Hillary Clinton showed up for debates. Joe Biden showed up for a debate. And as you just said, if you could hear him over the slight mumbling, um, he was being logical and reciting facts and all that. Um, Donald Trump showed up for a cage match and proceeded to hold a cage match. And his followers knew that. And the thing that troubles me most about Biden right now is he was completely un unaware and unprepared for a cage match. So I put Gorgeous George in the chat because Gorgeous George was a heel in England in pro wrestling. A heel is the villain everybody loves to hate. And Gorgeous George wore a pompadour wig and big golden golden locks and a beautiful, he's one of the guys who pioneered uh, uh, pro wrestlers dressing outrageously and people would jeer at him, but they loved him. He, he sold out arenas. Muhammad Ali picked up a big piece of Ali's style from Gorgeous George. The, I'm so beautiful, they're not gonna touch me, and I, I am better than everybody. That was Gorgeous George channeled through Ali's own personal experience. Trump understands that lineage and is in that lineage directly. He's the heel on an MMA stage. Remember, he has very deep experience of MMA, buddies with, with what's his name, who finally got tumbled out of uh, WWC, like McMahon. Um, Trump comes out of performance world and knows how to use old media against new media to like echo this thing so that he also knows, and this is um, not Lakoff, but someone else, I'm forgetting where this comes from. If, it, if you look powerful on the screen, it does not matter if the people talking about you or to you are insulting you and, tell, and telling people you're an idiot not to vote for you. If you look good, that's a win. And he can own, he has a way of owning the media cycle for days and days and days and getting free media without paying a dime for it, even though what everybody's saying is, is like, oh my God, this is terrible. So Howard Dean gets bounced off of his campaign trail for yelling hoarsely to his followers one day, and the next week he's not, not, no longer a candidate, a thing I've never understood. Joe Biden had a, an off debate and you know, half the crowd is like, oh my God, off with his head, he's gotta go. And I, I'm still unclear where I sort of fall on that. But the thing that worries me most is that he does not understand the rules of the game that he's in. And he is really in it. And the people who understand those rules are like, OMFG, you shouldn't vote for this guy because he's gonna lose against Putin. He's gonna lose against everybody. He doesn't understand modern combat, right? And, and, and I think Trump, deeply understands modern combat and is one of the most effective fighters in that reign, in that ring right now. And that scares me because there's a lot of reasonable people who are gonna vote for him because the, he understands the power dynamic. And, and I, it's clear to me that hardly anybody on the democratic side gets this. A few people do, and they are, they're, they're takedowns in Congress, for example, Jasmine Crockett's takedowns, Sheldon Whitehouse takedowns. Uh, there's, a whole, there's, there's a few junior Democrats who are just beautiful. Jamie Raskin's takedowns. Um, Jared Moskowitz is really good at this. Um, but, but nobody uh, is really um, figuring this out. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know that he, he wasn't trained in it other than to say that as an uber wealthy individual in America, his father's money bought him the ability to never hear the word no when it came to anything involving himself. And there, I'm pretty sure there are some psychological studies where the uber rich over time, because they never hear no and come to expect to never hear no, lose all empathy for everyone. So Trump is literally empathy less for anyone besides himself. And I usually he doesn't even fight for his own ego, kids. The, the egotism doesn't matter to me so much. Yeah, he's an egotist. I don't think he has a, a fragile ego. And nobody with a fragile ego would survive the assaults he's had since 2015. I mean, I have read the best criticisms of, of Trump over the years. They're, they're like eviscerating, they're withering, they're like devastating. Nobody with a weak ego would still be around going, hey, I'm gonna win the next election. So he doesn't have a weak yeah. ego, he has a huge ego, but he's just feeding off that ego, it's okay. And his followers yeah. are like, we need somebody who's got an ego and, who's got, and who wants to do battle. That's what his followers want. And we have logical people who are trying to have a debate. Nobody out there is shopping for a debater. That's but what the, scares me right now. The issue, though, is if you were the Democratic nominee right now and not Biden, 
and you didn't play into the logical, we need to do X, Y, and Z, and you were playing the same script Trump was. I'm not, sure, the, I'm not sure the antidote is the same script. I think there's an anti-anti script that somebody needs to figure out, but it's not adopting his ground rules. There, there's that certainly, but you still but need acknowledging to his ground rules. the logic of the, here's where we're going and what we're doing and why he is, and the way to really pick at Trump is to call him a loser actively. And that usually throws him way off his game. And then he'll spend the whole time making it painfully obvious, which Biden did in this debate to some extent is he poked him and said, oh, he's a loser. He's a liar. He's what? So all the time Trump spent talking about, I'm not a liar, which then makes the left really hate him that much more. So he didn't, you know, Trump didn't even come out with his list of five things, you know, let's build the wall, let's do Trump, this, let's do it. Trump accused Biden, Trump accused Biden of all the things Trump is committing and Biden yeah. had no comeback. Yeah. Well, I, he also Biden was defenseless. I was frightened yeah. for him. He was defenseless. Um, my, my read of, of Biden's non, non inability to respond is uh, the, you know, his team, the Democrats have leveled up to the, the, the they're at the level where it's like, okay, we're going to get trounced by the, in this cage match, but at least we, we know how vulnerable. to not go off the rails. Uh, we know how to not uh, yeah. melt down. We're, we're right just going to keep the party about line. That. Oh yeah, right. I totally agree. It's a it's a horrible strategy. Yeah, I, Jerry, I I love your analysis and I think it's great and I and want to kind of want to believe it. I I I'm with Aram. I don't think the man has a strategic bone in his body. Oh my god, uh, he's, he's so just, strategic. He is just a he, he looks strategic a, because he's at a loss for everything he, else. He's, he's, he's wanted to be president bull, since the eighties. He's you a bull in the China shop. Interviews of him. He's a bull in a china shop. He's got enough people around him to go, okay, well, ev while everyone's watching the bull, <laughs> or you know, I'm going to follow the bull and do whatever. I, the, I, I appreciate your analysis. It seems to me to be an analysis of somebody smart and thoughtful and says there must be some logic to this whole situation. I don't think there's any logic to the situation. It's just- but Trump is winning by breaking logic and by shattering norms and by totally tipping the apple cart very much on purpose. Uh, very much as a natural genius at it and without he's actually gifted. understanding what he's doing. I think he understands what he's doing. I, I actively believe he doesn't understand what he's doing. He's just doing what he does. It's an innate ability he has been trained for his entire life. And it only because it serves what he wants to do, does he do it? So it's not like, oh, I have this grandmaster plan and I'm going to carry it out. No, he he doesn't he doesn't have that system two thinking. He doesn't have that. It's literally knee jerk. I'm gonna play into this and see what the response is, and I'm just gonna keep shoveling bullshit. I not okay. you know there You're are also welcome. Welcome there are also over. examples in past history of what happens when psychopaths get power within culture and society, and usually that's when there are big shifts in. The society in which they live is there are things that a psychopath like a Donald Trump can do that Joe Biden could never get away with because of how he's doing it. But, the, but Joe Biden, Biden, Joe Biden, Biden what's right the long term? Biden what's could the long term? A couple norms and come back at Trump. Biden, Biden kind of just turned to Trump and said, "Donald, you are just so full of shit," and and yeah. everybody would be like, "Wait, Biden said that," and he said. The most shameful day in American history was January sixth, where you led an insurrection. Blah 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 blah. Your 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 dad dropped you a fortune. You pretty much squandered it, and somehow you found your way into blah blah blah. Like take him down peg by peg by peg, as a personal attack. Because yeah. Donald doesn't have defenses against that. Donald has or, a defense against logic. He's really impervious to logic. Or even up at one one step and say. In fact, you started an insurrection on January 6th, but you were too chicken shit to come out of the White House to actually lead it and make the give the outcome. So you sat you can't with handle the truth like, like a, a chicken and oh, Trump would have blown his stack. He would have blown his stack. Yeah, the Secret Service drivers wouldn't take me up there. He would confess in public just like uh, Nicholson. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. And he would have freaked out. But it's you go at him by calling him a loser and saying he's a liar constantly in front of him. And then he has then he tries to fight back. But but by the, and the other the subtle, bone of this in his body. The other subtle thing Trump does that is hard super hard to fight against in a debate is he practiced a gish galop from start to finish. And literally, you know, bullshit, 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 bullshit. And because it's bullshit, you don't have the time in a two minute or one minute response to respond to it other than to just call it out as bullshit. But even the moderators, there was no moderation whatsoever. It was just it was terrible. Terrible. I'll, terrible. I'm terrible. flipping the switch from your microphone to your microphone. Horrible. And, and that was a disservice to everyone. Horrible. Um, but yeah, I totally take what you and Pete are saying are big pieces of what's also going on. But I think from an identity perspective, How do you reconcile that with what you're with your some, belief some of what we're seeing is there are people who want to do the and and in part it's too it plays in because there's too much information overload. The average American is not reading, retaining, or paying attention to the 30 bit really big policy things that are going on works perfectly for trump you can't if you're jerry mikulski and you have a system for reading and aggregating and comparing these things you can pull it off because you know how to do the logic and you're willing to do the work but if you're average joe and you go to your plumbing job every day and you're focused on plumbing and you're focused on making money, feeding the kids, driving the kids back and forth to soccer practice, doing all the other stuff. It's just extra work that you feel like you don't need to do. So you're willing to let your system one heuristic play into this is the answer or that's the answer and ignore the rest. And the, the broadly the left either doesn't do that or they're willing to allow others who they know are experts to give them the answers. And on the right side, Trump is the one who's handing them the answers so they can cheat off his test. And then you don't have to do any work because, hey, life will be better. Even There's a lot of really smart people behind the curtain on the right, really evil geniuses who are working psychology, sociology, yeah. the whole thing much better than any progressive is. And they get it and they're they've enacted it. They've been this, they've had a long-term plan for 40 years that is now paying off. Look at the Federalist Society, look at look at you know, take the takeover of the judiciary, the takeover of local legislatures, the takeover of AM radio, the takeover of the evangelical church, the takeover of uh, the NRA. There was the NRA re revolt where basically they went from being a gun safety club to being nuts on the far right. <laughs> this is long-term planning uh, at a at a very high art. Yeah, and I don't like well, any of it. I, I hate it all. I think it's I think it's dastardly, but but they understand psychology and media, and have figured it out much better than anybody on the left. And we've got a circular firing squad on the left. Well, the the big turning point too was the turning news into entertainment that Fox did. Because it's at the end of my day, at the end of my day, I don't want to come home. I don't re I don't want to come home and watch people yelling unless they're yelling against things that I'm kind of at least somewhat behind. And they made it entertaining to yell at people doing bad things, you know. So every night, Bill O'Reilly gets up. If you're hurting the kids, I'm going to come after you. And you know who can't get behind like yeah pedophiles and crazies don't let them hurt the kids that that seems like something everybody can be behind but meanwhile behind the curtain what is he doing in his own personal life you know let's take advantage of everyone you know he, he's got he's god's flawed messenger for the evangelists and by the way he's been a bigger payoff for conservative um goals than any republican president maybe ever Maybe ever. Now, the, 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 the achievements, uh, forget legislation or whatever else, but but the, the actual progress on getting Roe v. Wade off the table, loading the bench, now weakening the government and, and giving the executive full power, like, wow. It's, it's really 
huge or huge, however you say it. It's huge. It's huge. Um, I, I've been reading uh, Tim Lacey's, it's an academic book on democracy and the great books idea that Adler and Hutchins put out in, they started in the 40s and put it out in 1952. Can you put the title in the chat? Yeah, but in some sense he makes the, he's kind of making the argument that the culture war started there. These, these highbrow academics are bringing these big, dense philosophical texts to the masses in hopes that when I'm done with my tradesman's job or working on the factory line at the end of the day, I'm going to entertain myself by reading Plato and Aristotle, and that's going to make my life better. Um, and and how democracy played into that at a time when we're fighting the Nazis and just coming out of the war, and you know, so everybody buys these sets, the vast majority of which probably sat on shelves gathering dust and remained unread. Um, and, and kind of that becomes the beginning of the cultural war split that we see amplified to the, the nth degree. Sounds like an interesting book. I mean, he, he doesn't get into it nearly as much as he does, but in reading between some of the lines, watching some of that cultural war play out is, or, or early on, I think, is just fascinating. I wish some people would write the stuff that's between the lines out more explicitly, because it'd be helpful. Oh, the Kulturkampf comes from Bismarck. Yeah, yeah. Example of this, which makes me think like, it's always a thing. It's always a thing that's never a thing, right? The, I the idea that <clears throat> the, the world moves forward by setting culture, but also that that somehow is frivolous is always part of politics you know well it seems to the having watched talking heads on sunday morning political shows most of my life in the 60s and 70s ish when you came on there was some kind of shared knowledge you all had and you would argue one side against the other but eventually there came to be too much stuff to know to be able to argue positively and so people would kind of do the political fudge of hey this is happening so i'm going to go that direction when the basis of the foundation of what they were arguing from was shaky to begin with and then now there's just too much to know totally so you can just make up whatever you need to do and say bullshit 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 and we're going this way and ai and, is going to make that more complicated and the, both the debater on the other side and the moderator who both kind of know what you're doing are trying to fight against that massive uphill battle that you can never win and the right has been doing that incredibly well for so long that it all now has become roughly that those debates and talks are all meaningless to the point that when you invite somebody on now, you know what the four talking points are going to be. And they're just never going to deviate from those talking points on their thing and never get to the underlying, Hey, we should be debating three levels below this about the truth or falsity of the facts you're using to make your argument. But instead, it's point bullshit one, two, three, and you you never get down far enough to correct the problem, much less to have the people who are watching it. So the only thing that is left for you is what was the dumb thing somebody said one day that was just so patently off that we can hammer on them with it all week long, and then that becomes the entertainment mm -hmm. rather than was it true or false to begin with and that's modern power and how we how we unravel that undermine that dampen that and get back to making better decisions together uh is a good goal i and uh, honestly i think the only thing that saves us is the fact that trump 
does not have a system two thinking capability. Which you think he doesn't. Is, is if he did, he would be the next Hitler and we would be going down the toilet on day one of his presidency. Or we would have gone down the toilet on January 6th if he knew what he was doing. And it's all the people around him who are preventing the entire enterprise from toppling over. Um, but if he really knew what he was doing, he could do what he's doing now and actually have a plan and would get things done. But instead, he wants, you know, he spends all his time yelling at the TV, essentially, and not actually doing anything about it, even when he's in power as president and could do the thing. You know, he he doesn't because it's easier for him to sit on the couch and watch Fox News all day. And, and yell at people. Yeah. Yep. I, I, I agree. Trump Trump could have been a lot more successful if he actually could think. Uh, I So I think he got hampered by having to have some adults in the room the first time around. And they did a very nice job of, of like throwing their bodies in front of the train multiple times. And there's a bunch of stories about that. I think that this administration is being crafted from the get-go to not allow that to happen. I think they're going to get a bunch of people in office and pass a bunch of laws that gut the place, absolutely gut the place. And they're ready for it. But the Project 2025 is one of many different proposals mm -hmm. and plans, and they are on board. He, they're, he, they're ready he, for it. Uh, there are enough of them who are actually capable of doing that against a prepared democratic opposition to accomplish it. So you can have a Stephen Miller, but is he actually capable of carrying it out? Now Miller he is a dastardly operative. He is smart enough to know I want us to go that way, but he needs and he can say that to Trump and be the the guy on his side, but you need the Newt Gingriches to architect it and do it and strategize and plan way ahead to actually make it happen. But and I don't what know people are doing. I don't know if there are enough of those people to actually do that. You are underestimating the size of I the I made them. Yeah, yeah, no, they're, they're, they're very organized and they're, they're winning. Like it's ha it's working uh, despite in incredible close calls. Like the number of times I was pretty sure this is going to do Trump in, right? Uh, none of which, none of which have worked. Uh, there, you know, there, there are 94 indictments, uh, that he was up for on four cases. Uh, 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 some months ago, any one of which would have been be enough to take him out of the race, maybe even put him in jail. At this point, he and his lawyers and everybody else backing him have managed to build a set of little stones so that um, the Supreme Court dallied for a while and then said, oh, actually, there's a lot of immunity here and so on and so forth. And we are now in whole new territory. I, I, I don't know. I, in the run-up to the 2016 election, I read David K. Johnson's book, The Making of Donald Trump, uh, in which he he basically lays out the 4,000 lawsuits that have been brought against DJT and the Trump Organization. It's like, you do not sue these people lightly because their first tactic is to countersue. They will darken the sky with lawyers to get you. And so 4,000 people and companies had sued for, hey, you didn't pay my invoice, all the way to who knows what. Before... 2016, right? And then think of all the things that are on the ledger from then until now, and then think of Obama's tan suit, uh, the, the Dean scream, uh, and, and the, the idea that everybody on the left is handcuffed and in a straitjacket and unable to do anything actually that will catch anybody's attention and say, oh, I get it that this is an important moment and I'm willing to break some rules too. But, but you also have to be able to not only break the rules, but then be able to get away with it. So someone like Al Franken, who comes up to the line, and maybe something did happen, but when the scandal hit for him, within a couple of days, uh, I'm resigning my position, I'll move on. The left took and, him out. The left took him the, out. The left took him out. But the problem is, anytime you do that, the left is always going to take you out because we know there are enough... Maybe they don't have to. Smart people, and hopefully you're not, I mean, we don't have, there's not been a case where there's been somebody 
who is an actual linchpin of holding a majority where had it been 49-51 and him being out means power goes to the right because maybe his replacement shifts power. We haven't had that. So the left hasn't had to make that hard choice. Or in a, a case like now, let's say, you know, let's say Biden realizes what is really wrong and uses executive power to assassinate Donald Trump because he, he knows to up, uphold the Constitution as it's written to protect our freedom. The only way to do that is to assassinate Trump and then things, at least they're still screwed up, but they kind of go back to normal. And even if the Supreme Court says, no, that was a, an individual action and not a presidential one, okay, he goes to prison or he's, he's, you know, he is tried and goes and whether he gets it or not, his running mate who wins in a landslide pardons him and then he retires into whatever. Mm -hmm. but I, no one on the left is vitiating for that as a, an outcome. Like here's your last chance because if you do it and you lose and Trump takes power, we're we're in a, a shit storm. So before January 6th, if you lose the election, you got to take presidential power and use it against, and then whoever his running mate is does what they do. And But it's not going to be, they're not going to have the power that Trump has or the ability to do what Trump's doing. One of my wishful thinking hopes is that there isn't a good successor to Trump. There's nobody, there's nobody who understands the dynamics of the moment as well as he does and has the public imagination as deeply as he does. I mean, uh, DeSantis tried really hard to out Trump Trump and got wiped off the stage after some well, struggle. Well, that, that's because DeSantis has a system two ability and he's not a sociopath to not care the way Trump doesn't care. Mm -hmm. yep. and, and that's the problem is almost everybody in politics, the only way to move up in that system is to actually care and do something about it. Whereas Trump, and you'll notice, came from totally outside of politics. Oh, let's elect a businessman as leader. And he's so successful and no one, you know, we realized far too late or the people who supported him realized far too late with his tactics, taking off all the people who did care and had some empathy that he really wasn't a successful businessman. His father bought it all for him and he's not good. He's not good at it. And he wasn't even actively good at being a president because he lacked the system to ability to think and do the things he needed to do. Um, so I know. wish I could stay. I'm gonna go. I'm glad we've solved I, this though. I, I, I wish we could solve it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, fireworks. <laughs> I, I really appreciate this conversation, even though I'm the only person uh holding my opinion. But but I really like like everything that's come up. It's good. Uh, me too. Thank you for that. Thanks, folks. Go fellowship yeah. at a link. This might be our survival pod right here. <laughs> well, we got we all got the interlink arms enough to hold the hold the wall, you know. Exactly, exactly. Thanks, y'all. You're around, folks. Good talking.